Hi, I'm Janice McCarthy, and as of January 2023, Chair of the Parsippany Environmental Advisory Committee. So welcome today, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, today, what we'd like to do is provide an overview of the Environmental Committee, its purpose, and its accomplishments. The Committee's mission is to represent and educate Parsippany residents and to help the town achieve lasting improvements to the quality of the environment, natural resources that support a sustainable community for current and future generations. The committee has nine volunteer members. Uh, they're appointed by the mayor and the town council. Um, they serve to advise and offer recommendations to the council and mayor uh, related to the environmental matters that support and encourage actions and policies to protect and improve the quality of the land, water, and air. Laura McCluskey served on the committee starting in 1998. Mm -hmm. Right, Laura? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, environmental yeah. uh, wasn't so out front as it is now, right, Laura? No, we didn't have an environment back then. Yeah, we didn't even have one, so nobody was interested in yeah, it. Yeah, no one was interested. Didn't care about it. But Laura served from 1998, and then in 2008, she became the chair of the committee until the end of uh, last year when she decided to retire. Mm -hmm. But Laura has graciously agreed to highlight the committee's accomplishments throughout her tenure. So, Laura, it's all yours. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So as Janice said, I was the uh, chairperson for many years of the Environmental Committee, proudly serving. And um, over that time period, we really did a lot of things in Parsippany. One of the reasons we're having this green fair is so that we hopefully residents will not only come, but I think we're going to have a recorded copy that will probably be available through the library. And we're really just trying to let people know that we're here because you know everybody gets busy and we're not always advertising what we're doing and things like that. So what I'm gonna do is just highlight some of our past accomplishments and you'll see how um, important the Environmental Advisory Committee has been for the township and hopefully moving forward we'll be more involved. I know Matt's uh, gave you a really good overview of um, you know, reducing carbon emissions in town, for example. So we are working hand in hand with the green team and one of our offshoot uh, committees is the bat protection program. So we're, you know, trying to think what does Parsippany need in terms of environmental um, uh, protection and sustainability issues and things like that. And then we step in and try to fill that void. Okay. So in the past, um, we, we started in 1995. This was an ordinance, um, just for everyone's uh information and ordinance begins as a uh, usually a resolution someone says I have an idea I would like to do this and you go into the town council and the mayor and you say can I do this and they make a resolution and if the town council all votes on it then it becomes an ordinance um, and when it becomes an ordinance it's a law and the law is for the t an ordinance is a township law so it's sort of like a little mini law kind of thing so we became uh, an environmental committee via an ordinance through the Planning and Zoning Committee. Um, there was a need, um, as Janice had said, there wasn't a lot going on in environmental science at the time. Um, there was, but we weren't really, you know, it wasn't in the forefront like it is today. But they started to develop a need for environmental information for people who were non-environmentalists but were working in politics because they make the rules. So there had to, there had to be this you know, side by side working that we needed to um, to figure out. So in 1995, um, Mayor Mimi Letts actually, I believe, was the uh, ordinance uh, signer of the, you know, started it. And we became the Environmental Advisory Committee. And what we were originally assigned to do was to be advisors to the town council and the mayor as environmental issues came up. And so we started to think, what else could we do um, we were working in that capacity when there was a development in town or if there was a, a stormwater problem. Um, we're, I'm going to talk a little later about Hurricane Irene. When the issues came up that were uh, in, involved some environmental um, science background, we served that purpose. 
But in the meantime, we were, you know, twiddling our thumbs and saying, what else can we do? So these are some of the projects that we actually have gotten involved in. Um, in 2000, we worked with Dr. Abrupta. He is a uh, professor at Rutgers Cook College, which is the environmental portion of the college. And we started the Troy Book Brook Water Quality Study. So he started it just as a group of graduate students coming up using nets and waders, you know, all that fun stuff you go into. That's the fun part of environmental science, I have to say. You go into the water and you're, you know, fishing out little critters and things like that. Um, we use, people who say critters, but they're actually called macroinvertebrates. Um, they are any organism that you can see without a microscope, but does not have a backbone. So you're thinking crayfish and mayflies and caddisflies, larvae, things like that. So he actually, you know, brought his grad students up and they did a really extensive study, I think of 10 different points along the Troy Brook. And these macroinvertebrates are index organisms, which means that you can pick them up and say, oh, I found a crayfish, and it'll tell you the quality of that water because a crayfish was living there. If you find leeches, you find um, uh, caddisflies, if you find different types of organisms, you can uh, determine the water quality. So that's what he was, you know, sort of putting those two things together. It was so successful that he's not only wanted to do it the next year, but he's been doing it every single year since the year 2000. So 23 years now where he has students come up, there's uh, the reports are online, and he does this macroinvertebrate study. And Troy Brook is a really important um, recharge water it's it's everything's connected i know you've, you've heard that before it is so true troy brook water seeps into the soil goes into the ground goes into our aquifer and you drink it so it's really important that we we connect all those things um in 2002 we got into the high schools um, i'm a retired teacher i'm retired from everything thank you very much yes <laughs> i retired from the environmental committee i'm a retired teacher now um so when i was in the parsippany school district for um a good uh, 30 years so a long time and um we uh, worked with the um health teacher it was carol's adams bound at the time i think it was and uh, she said, you know, in our school, we have mercury thermometers. And this is going back maybe to the 50s, you know, where you had those silver thermometers with the silver in it. And, of course, kids drop thermometers, and thermometers break, and this mercury, which is extremely dangerous, was going on the floor and stuff. So we exchanged all of the mercury thermometers in the schools with alcohol thermometers, which now are red. You see a red line, and that's alcohol. If it breaks, it's not dangerous. So that was a good, a good program. Um, in 2003, we started opening up our knowledge to the township. We ran three different education forums at Persephone Hills High School, um, and they were a lot of fun. Not, not very well attended. It would have been nice if attendance had been up with that, but um, we ran them. We did stormwater, and uh, we did another one for um, uh, Persephone um, uh, st uh, climate, climate uh, change and things like that, and um, it was just a good project we have these are our projects which we're trying to get information like today information to residents in the community it's so important um, you're all going to go home smarter <laughs> so that's a really good thing um, in 2004 um, this was a little uh, near and dear to my heart um, the two people sitting on the storm drain there one of them is my niece who I got involved in uh the storm drain stenciling program, and I had, I had gone to a conference, and they, they were like, well, we're putting these little tags on storm drains. They're not, you know, people, I, side note, they're not sewers. You know, people always say, oh, look, you know, there's the sewer, or throw it down the sewer, or things like that. These are storm drains only for water, strictly for water. Please don't put anything in them, not even leaves, if you can help it. Keep them cleared if you live near one. Um, so these are just to channel water away into our lakes and streams so that it doesn't flood your house. So anyway, we were going to put these little tags. Uh, I went to this conference and they said, well, we're putting these little tags on this program that said, on, on the storm drains that say drains to stream or drains to lake or drains to waterway. And it's a little fish on it. So here you are in the middle of town. Um, looking at the, st at the storm drain and it has a fish and it's supposed to remind people that if you put something in there it is going to go all the way down the channels and through the tubes and all of that and end up 
in a lake somewhere and if it's a rubber band or if it's a plastic bag or if it's a balloon an animal can eat it and really you know have a horrible horrible experience with that so um, just you know to, so it was just this little um, concept of a fish and so we started the program, we did the first storm drain stenciling, we literally walked around Lake Parsippany with little tags and glue, <laughs> we would glue them onto the storm drains, and uh, that started the storm drain program. And now, as you know, they're actual metal plates, and they're bolted on, and every town does it, and it's really, it, it makes a difference. And that's one of the things that we're really proud of, that it makes a difference. So in 2005, actually, if you remember, Ann Grassi was town councilwoman, and she was our council liaison. So from, for everything that we did, we had a town council member be our connection to the town council. So um, with Ann's help, we, we um, remember an ordinance is a law. We passed the Wellhead Protection Ordinance, and this was really nice because our town gets its water from wells, and there are approximately 18 wells in our community, and within those 18 wells is an area around the well that really needs to be protected from things like, you can't put a, you can't put a gas station there because gasoline will leak into it. You shouldn't have a parking lot there because car oil will leak into it. And you gotta, you gotta literally protect this area, and you can see with the concentric circles that there's three tiers. There's a, a major tier right by the well Head, and then there's there's an outer tier and a farther tier and you can put different types of development there but you have to adhere to these laws and it protects our wells and without that in place people could build there without without having to have the you know have that responsibility it's a responsibility so that was a big thing we did um, so moving on to 2007, we did the low phosphate fertilizer ordinance. You, a lot of you live near lakes. We have Rainbow Lakes. We have Lake Parsippany. I read somewhere we had 23 lakes in Parsippany. I have to, yet to find them all, but I'm looking. <laughs> I continue to look, um, but I'm not. I wouldn't be surprised because um, just a little. Again, a side note: when Parsippany was formed, it was formed by glaciers coming down the Wisconsin glacier, and then it went back up again. And as it did, it dragged rocks and stones. But most importantly, it created these valleys. Okay, so that's why Parsippany has a lot of lakes. Well, though Lake Parsippany is a man-made lake, but it still had to have that depression to begin with. So um, the low phosphate fertilizer helps lakes because phosphate is one of the nutrients in fertilizers that create eutrophication, which is an overgrowth of algae. And I know when you guys go swimming, you do not want to go into that yucky, we call it scum on the top of the water, yuck, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. Lower phosphate fertilizers that like people put on their lawns and we put on the golf course and we put on the um, town, the town uh, lawns. Um, if it's a lower phosphate level, it will not produce the nutrients to overgrow that algae. Um, the Cool Cities Mayor Climate Change, we actually had the mayor, our, our Mayor Luther at the time, some, we were, I worked with a lot of mayors too, <laughs> Mayor Luther at the time actually signed a Climate Change Action Pledge, which just said that we will make a commitment as a town to lower our, um, our, our carbon emissions and be part of a global climate change move, movement. That was 2008. Um, Hurricane Irene, I live in Lake Hiawatha. I cannot begin to tell you about that night. Um, Hurricane Irene came into town. Um, the ground was saturated. We had already had three days of rain. And it poured, not only did it pour rain, but there was an issue with the reservoir, with the water pressure. The water came over the reservoir sides, went down into the Rockaway River, which runs right along Lakeshore Drive. And the water literally rose up five blocks so fast that people were coming up barefoot and in their pajamas and the water was coming behind them. I get a little emotional talking about it. It was unbelievable. I don't think a lot of people in Persephone know about that. 84 homes were lost and a lot of people were lost their homes because there was no the flood insurance and all that stuff wasn't covered. It's a long story, but um, Hurricane Irene. So anyway, the Environmental Advisory Committee came in and we did a very extensive report. It's actually online on the town website 
um, about what happened that night. Um, if you talk about the perfect storm, it was about 10 different variables that came into place that, like I said, the ground was saturated, the, the rain was extensive, the, the reservoir pressure was, uh, was too much, and there were just a lot of things that happened that just made that happen. It was very sad. Um, Watnung Gardens um, is just a little garden that's in town that was on Forbes magazine's list of the 15 most beautiful backyard gardens in the country. And garden clubs from all over the country actually get buses and come here and see this. Over the years, it has sort of uh, been taken over by the township. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on there, but it was our, it was our town's garden for many years. We've done district-wide programs, so we did uh, the Goldfinch Project. If anybody has kids in the school system over the last like 10 years or 15 years, you may have heard of the Goldfinch Project, Wild in Parsippany, or our bat, extent, our bat Education Program that took place over Halloween. So we did, it's a, a district-wide uh, education program, which was pretty fun to do. Um, the Fall Festival, we're always there every year. We love being there. Um, we work with the green team on that. Um, the plastic bag ban, um, I would like uh, Janice McCarthy, who is a former councilwoman, to please stand up because she is instrumental, ladies and gentlemen, in taking the uh, bag ban to an ordinance. We had it passed months before it was passed as a state law. You, you should be proud of that as a community because we, we stood up and said, we're going to do it before you make us do it. Really good. Yeah. So excited. <laughs> and it did become a state law, as you all know, and that's wonderful too. And then lastly, we're in 2023. We have our Green Fair. Uh, this is our second annual. We hope to continue it. Thank you all for coming really so much. One of our projects in the future is outside of this library. We're hoping in the spring to put in a pollinator garden with um, an education walkway where you're going to be able to walk through and read about native plants and pollinators and bat pollinators, Lisa, we'll get that in there. <laughs> and we're gonna get uh, that information done. And then lastly, we know the town is looking at a farmer's market in the future and we are 100% behind that. And hopefully we'll see you all there on a Friday night, at Vet picture it, a Friday night at Veterans Park with food trucks and music. Okay, anyway, there's my thing for it. <laughs> so that's it. And uh, Janice McCarthy's going to come back up and talk a little bit about uh, another, pro we, or, you know, another project that we may be uh, looking at in our future. We just wanted to bring attention to the gas-powered leaf blowers and show how detrimental they really are to our communities, really to our state. And this is just, you know, I'm not going to go over it all because I think you can read it for yourself. But this just gives you some idea of how it impacts our communities. Gas leaf blowers emit herbicides, pesticides, pollen, animal feces, heavy metal, and these substances are all also uh, contribute to health risks. So this is what's blowing around when you see all the the uh, landscapers out there doing their uh, landscaping. Um, this is what's being spread around. And the emissions from that, unbelievably, like a Ford 150 traveling 3,900 miles. Now, when you think about the significance of that, that's a half hour. And these go on all day long in just about every community. The noise from a leaf blower is 100 decibels. That's, that's, uh, that's comparable to a jet taking off. And a half hour listening to that can cause hearing damage. And we've all been outside listening to that. And this is just what the impact is on nature. And, and it's just a simple, the leaves provide a blanket, and they're a natural protection for plants and roots and soil, and they provide nutrients that goes back into the ground. And the nutrients then protect the habitat for insects. Insects pollinate, they support the soil, the flowers, growth and the insects are essential as food sources. Leaf blowers, unbelievably, 200 miles an hour. That's what they are, 200 miles per hour. And they dislodge everything, everything that's essential to these insects and birds. The wind just blasts them into oblivion. So in turn, you're eliminating these blankets of protection, you're exposing the roots, you're depriving nutrients. 
So the gas-powered leaf blowers, we barely notice the decline in the plants and flowers over the years and the wildlife, and we've grown so used to and accepted these leaf blowers. But knowing the negative effects and the health risks to human and nature, and it's time to question their use and to find alternatives. And there are alternatives. We don't have to keep using these projects. There's thousands of dollars that people spend every year you know, lawn mowers, with gas-powered lawn mowers, you know, the leaf blowers, snow blowers. There's just, there's just a, a products that just emit so much carbon in the air, it's, it's a lot. So just in ending this, what we're working toward, all of us are really working toward, is sustainable communities um, and communities that support smart development, improve water quality, and all cleaner environments. But we welcome all of your participation in these projects and programs and events. The Porcipity Environmental Advisory Committee, we have a town website, we also have a Facebook page. And you know, we just would uh, look forward to your participation in any of our programs or any events that we hold. And just a note that I don't know who quoted this, so I'm going to take credit for it. Um, when people gather together, they make a difference and incredible things happen. So thank you for being here. Thank you.